helpful just to get started and then kind of people might um, trickle in as we get going, but um, I'll just start with a brief, are we all set with the, thank you, um, with a brief introduction, um, my name is Karen Ganey and uh, this is my third year working for Henderson's. Uh, I kind of got into landscaping by way of uh, sustainable farming and studying sustainable ag in school and my interest has followed this kind of winding river from growing annual vegetables to getting really interested in permaculture, which is more of uh, establishing perennial food crops and systems um, that are more self-sustaining, um, which has led me into more branches of studying herbs uh, and soil and compost. So this past winter, um, I took a course that uh, the um, University of Vermont Extension Agency is, is doing uh, for $40, and anyone can, can sign up to take this course. It's, a, it's four weeks long and it's the Master Composter course. Um, so it's incredible. There's, it was, I think it, it was like three or four hours Thursday nights and there was lectures and um, accompanied readings. Um, but we learned from the people in the state that are really doing this work. Um, the Highfields Institute, um, the UVM Extension, of course, and then a number of different soil scientists um, that are really helping to disseminate information about the Universal Recycling Law that was passed recently in Vermont, Act 148, which I'll talk briefly about. Um, and, and so the idea is, is to start a, a broad public um, education campaign to help all of us understand what the implications of Act 148 are, and also um, what the, the logistics and ins and outs of composting are, because we're all gonna be um, hopefully composting more. So we really want to understand, hi there, um, you know, how to do that the best that we can. Um, so that's kind of, that's why I took the course and um, I'm always um, loving the, the learning when it comes to compost and special soil ecology because there's just so much there. It's, a, it's an incredible field uh, where there's still a lot that's being understood about um, how soils work to recycle nutrients. Um, the importance of that and, um, and, and why composting is going to be a really valuable tool going into the future, not just for our own um, you know, ability to uh, recycle our food scraps, but also for uh, benefiting the local economy and in creating biodiversity. So we're going to talk a little bit about the social and political imp implications um, of composting on a small and also a large scale. Um, so, so thanks so much for coming. I think what I would love to do is just a brief go around with your name, maybe the town that you're from, and whether you compost at home or not, or, and or a piece of information that you're really hoping to get today out of this workshop. Um, so we start here, Alicia. <clears throat> My name's Alicia. I'm from the Barnard area. Uh, I've done some of the bin composting before, you know, with a tumbler. I'm currently using that at home. Um, and I've done the like farm bed kind of composting, section off chicken wire areas. Oh, nice. Uh, I would like to learn the most effective and efficient ways for composting and compost identification. Awesome. Yeah. All the stuff going in, the best stuff to use, what things not to use, uh, and the like. Great. <laughs> Hi, I'm Steve from uh, South Stratford, and I've been composting um, for about uh, 15 years, totally unsuccessfully. <laughs> I'm Agnes, I'm from New York City, um, and I was interested in this um, workshop because I go to a high school and, um, in New York, we just, the initiative trying to start for um, private sc uh, public schools to start composting their food scraps, and since I go to a kind of smallish school, um, they started first as kind of, kind of a tryout at my school, and so I've been one of the kids that have been trying to encourage everyone else to um, compost their food scraps and we've been having a hard time and so I just wanted to find some ways that might help other people learn about compost. Wonderful. Great. Thanks for being here. I'm Stephanie and I'm from the next town over in, in uh, Sharon and um, I've had this massive compost pile that really doesn't compost. So I'm like you. I'm hoping that I have lots of bees and lots of insects and lots of happy dogs. But I would really like to expedite and make it quicker so I can use it. Awesome. 
Uh, my name is Brenna. I'm from West Lebanon, and I would like some tips on getting uh, a more efficient process for my location. Uh, it's kind of in the shade. I there's not a whole lot of heat yes. generated, so uh, it, let's call it extenuating circumstances. Okay, great. Thanks, Brenna. Um, I'm Audrey. I'm from Lebanon. Um, my family composted a lot when I was growing up. Um, and I'm just starting to compost here now, so looking for some tips and tricks maybe to get it going. Great. My name is Susan. I just moved to Stratford about a month and a half, two months ago, and inherited a, I guess it's a 5x5 five five compost, which I started putting stuff in, and I now realize I probably shouldn't have done that. I should have started something new. So I'm kind of interested in figuring out what to do about that just how to use it. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm Judy. I uh, live in Thetford Center. I've uh, composted for um, decades, I'd say. I love soil science and uh, currently, I use mostly a three bin system mm -hmm. and am taking the master composter classes this fall. Yay. And just here looking for um, tidbits of how to maximize mm -hmm. um, the heat season mm -hmm. of summer and how to capture and maybe extend it into the fall and what to do in the cold weather. Okay, great. Yeah, good questions. Okay. Here, why don't we go here and move? I'm Phil from West Hartford, and over the years we've been accumulating piles of leaves and grass clippings and household organic waste. And sitting here, not going to do much of anything, and I'm just here to learn how to everybody else wants to speak to so. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Learn how to use it when it's when it's right. Awesome. Good. Nice. And I'm Marilyn and his wife. I dump scraps in the thing and leave it there so I don't know. But no, I don't know. Thanks for coming. Kathy from West Fairway. And, um, I compost now and was here more to find out as much as I could about the new law and what it's going to mean as far as Eventually, you have no garbage. So, what happens with those food scraps that aren't compostable? Like that? Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Good questions. I'm Andy from West Philly, and I thought this was a yard sale. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you got him here, right? So it's good to know these tricks. <laughs> what she said. <laughs> Awesome. Well, it sounds like everyone is really uh, has some great questions, and um, and that will, yeah, that'll help add some good fertility to our dialogue here. Um, so I, I'm just going to start out with just going over basically what compost is, um, and oftentimes it's a term I find that gets, and by myself included, is simultaneous or uh, used s synonymously with. Uh, with like food scraps. So I say, oh, put it in the compost bucket. But it's kind of like, you know, food scraps are like uh, the preliminary to, co to compost. Compost is actually the byproduct of the decomposition of life. Um, and the, made the primary building block of life is carbon. So it's specifically the decomposition of carbon. Um, and there's a number of different things that do that. Um, but uh, I, you know, I just want to be clear, compost is actually a finished material, whereas uh, food scraps or organic material or lawn scraps are, are, uh, are more of a raw product. So it's kind of like saying, you know, what bread, the difference between bread and toast. You know, after we get toast, after we toast it, we get compost after it, it decomposes. Um, so there's, uh, so, so basically that is what it is. And we're gonna get into a little bit more of the logistics of getting the right mix, um, all the different uh, microbes and temperatures that are necessary to produce compost. Um, but it, you know, essentially life happens and compost is a part of that cycle that happens um, you know, with or without us. 
Um, so when we start to get involved with the act of composting, what we're doing is trying to encourage an ideal environment for soil microbes and um, all kinds of bacteria to do what they do best. We're just the stewards of creating that process. Um, so there are a number of reasons why um, we could be composting, why we should be composting, and what the benefits are. And I've listed um, eight here about why to compost, um, but just quickly we'll go through those a little bit. Um, by by creating a material that we can use in our gardens, what we're doing is effectively adding organic matter to our soils. And organic matter is extremely important in the process of uh, growing not only vegetables, but uh, maintaining biodiversity. Uh, because what it does is it enables plants, it's, it's the binding agent that enables plants to be able to access nutrients from the soil. So it's that organic matter which provides aggregates that have both soil, um, soil nutrients and uh, water that the plants are able to take up. If there's no organic matter in the soil, what happens is um, water can run through and thus nutrients can run through and plants can become deficiency and deficient in what they need. Um, addition, in addition to that, it also provides um, a, a healthier environment and any time we have an environment that is uh, operating at its maximum health, we're increasing biodiversity. So more niches are created for not only soil microbes, but also the, like, what's happening under the soil, but what's happening above the soil as well. And so we'll get into a little bit more about organic matter. Um, so another important reason to compost is that it actually sequesters carbon in the soil. So um, it, we're in a situation right now where we have uh, climate change um, that are as a number of that is attributed to a number of different um, um, you know human um, human factors and you know which we can go into a lot of that like why climate change but really what we have to be doing is to curb climate change we have to be sequestering as much carbon as we can because as we all know carbon is a fossil fuel and it's a greenhouse gas it's an it's a um, I'm sorry it's a uh, byproduct of fossil fuel burning, but it's a greenhouse gas. So as much as we can be sequestering carbon by way of keeping old growth trees, leaving large stands of forests, but also thinking of how can we be taking it out of the atmosphere and into the soil. And compost is no, one of the number one ways of being able to do that. Um, so I already talked a, lot, talked a little bit about it, improving plant growth. Um, it conserves water because uh, we need less water when there's organic matter in the soil, which is what compost does and, and brings in. Uh, it reduces reliance upon chemical pesticides and fertilizers. So this is one way that we can be really proactive on the front end and the back end. We don't wanna be adding um, any kind of fossil fuel inputs, which is what I like to say in terms of pesticides or fertilizers, because sometimes we become removed from this idea of well, what is a pesticide or an herbicide, and really it's a, it's a byproduct of uh, the fossil fuel industry. So as much as we can be limiting our dependence on that, um, the better poised we're gonna be able to be able to move into the future more sustainably. Um, so by way of creating healthy soils and healthy gardens, we don't need to be adding fertilizers. It becomes obsolete. Um, so it's just an incredible way um, to, to do some positive acting against climate change and restoring the soils. Because we're also at a loss of topsoil. I don't know if you're all familiar, but we're losing topsoil at a really extreme rate because of industrial agriculture. So as much as we can be restoring soils and increasing biodiversity is, is a really countercultural approach to what the dominant paradigm is creating in our food system. Uh, so it contributes to biodiversity, I said that. Um, and it also is really reduces the amount of materials that would be going into the landfill. I've heard a couple of different numbers and percentages, but um, you know it's up to 40% of uh, what we throw away is food scraps, and that could all be recycled into soils and into our gardens. And um, you know there's a lot of research being done out there. Even what else could we be composting? You know, taking recycling to the next step, and we can of course uh, compost all organic matter. But there's experiments being done, or trials, I should say, um, all around the world with many very prestigious organizations looking at composting, you know, papers and, um, you know, things that maybe at one point derive themselves from uh, living materials, but, um, you know, might have some chemicals in that. So how can we use compost as a process to, re to really, um, you know, recycle some of those nutrients as well? I got a little bit hung up on number seven. You've mentioned that a couple of times. Could you explore that a little bit more? Sure. So 
anytime, so by composting, what we're doing is we're restoring our soil quality. And anytime there's a healthy soil medium, which is really the foundation of any garden, forest, or ecosystem. So the healthier that is, relates to the more organic matter there is in there. So composting is effectively adding organic matter to the soils and thus enabling more growth. So in some ways, so we're able, so like if you have a, an area that is um, nutrient deficient, you're only gonna be able to maximize so much growth from that area. Maybe, you know, whatever it is, maybe if it's your annual garden, you could produce lettuce, tomatoes, maybe your tomatoes aren't ripening fully. If your, if your soil is really healthy, you can maximize what you're growing because the plants are using the nutrients more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Thus, it's not, and it's not running out of the soils. I'm so, talking about the biodiversity, biodiversity one. Okay, so biodiversity is actually, <laughs> I, it relates, I just didn't say I'm it sure. so clearly, I guess, I'm sorry. But biodiversity is actually, um, it, it means that there's more uh, organisms, right? Mm -hmm. So basically that's like the simplest version of biodiversity. Like there's a, an abundance of growth, abundance of organisms. Mm -hmm. So if, we're, if our soils are healthy, more organisms are able to thrive. Okay. So in the soil, the decomposers, the bacteria, mm -hmm. the mycelium, those are three things that are all helping to create more life. So the healthier the soil is, the more life that's able to thrive in those okay. soils. And the healthier the soils are, the more life is able to thrive above the soils. Okay. So, it, you know, it's funny because I can, you know, you can approach it from any place in the um, food cycle web, you know, because this, the health of the soils relates to the health of the plants, which relates to the health of the ecosystem. And even if, just in that one word ecosystem, we're talking, you know, birds, bees, pollinators, and then the health of the pollinators relates to the health of the system. So that's, you know, effectively how we would increase and improve our biodiversity. So really it all starts with the soil. And if we have a deficient, a system that's deficient in nutrients, we're not gonna be reaching all those places of like fruit, flower production, bee production, bird production, soil production, so yeah. Okay. So are there, I'm assuming that there's studies out there that also indicate that with um, enriched organic matter, a healthier soil, that the nutrient content of the produce is richer, more diverse, and higher itself. So. Oh, absolutely. I mean, so what we know about plants is that they uptake nutrients. Like, they live right. by way. So any time, and so what's happened with industrial agriculture is over many years, um, by tilling, the soil, the top soil is lost because there's more um, sun, rain impact that creates erosion and it, it kills all the bacteria that are in like the top you know the arguably 12 to 24 inches in the first layers of the soil so so what we're doing is we're putting heavy chemical inputs for that our uh, fertilizer for the plants and then that's what the plants uptake and that's what we take in so but the soil when it's high in organic matter has all the tremendous amount of um, micronutrients and macronutrients mm -hmm. that the plants are able to take up so and there are a lot of studies out there now that are saying you know nutrition is all is relational to food but it's really more re relational to soils and soil health mm -hmm. you know because we all know that broccoli has lots of calcium in it but if the soil is deficient in calcium it won't be taking up those nutrients magnesium, magnesium. Yeah. Magnesium. manganese <laughs> which is one of the which are our uptakers so right so yeah, when I was in high school, I did a, an experiment for the, the, the science fair and did um, a test of the macro and micronutrients in organic versus non-organic produce and soils. And there was some variance, but at the time I couldn't find any research that had been done out there. And now there's a lot more research that's contributing. And um, there's a great video on YouTube of this. I think it's a, a seven-year-old in second grade and she does an experiment sprouting organic and non-organic uh, sweet potatoes. And the organic produces all this foliage off the top, and the non-organic one doesn't do anything, and finally sends up one shoot. It's like she does, she takes pictures and um, does photo journaling over the period of like six months. It's really interesting. You can search sweet potatoes, something you know, like experiment seven-year-old on YouTube, and you see, you know, which one is life encouraging and which one is life destroying. It's just black and white to me. Especially the more that I learn about all these topics. And, um. So I hope that answers your question about biodiversity. And please, you know, interrupt at any point with questions and if something is not clear. Um, so, uh, let's see, where, where are we at number 
Amy reduces the volume of material. Oh, we talked about the landfills. Um, benefits to local economies. So as we've learned, and especially here in Vermont, we know that a lot of, hi, welcome. Um, we know that uh, the culture in Vermont really developed because of the soils in Vermont. Even just being so close to New Hampshire, one developed as an agricultural state and one developed as uh, you know, more of a you know industrial state. Does anyone know why that is? Even though I gave you a big hint. <laughs> well, the, the watersheds are totally different in Vermont and New Hampshire. And if you look at the rivers in New Hampshire, the tools in New Hampshire, um, they lend themselves to logging in the cities. And if you look at the topography of Vermont, with the hills and the valleys. It lent itself to small community development locally using the um, good pH topsoil to support the local yeah. community. But it was very community based. Right. And yeah, we don't have the navigation up and down <coughs> large rivers to that New Hampshire does. It's just very different geologically. It is. Yeah, so you said a really important thing there. The watershed is huge. And also, the soils themselves really contribute to those watersheds. So right. New Hampshire has a lot of granite. And so the soils <coughs> didn't really render themselves um, you know, too accessible for agriculture. Whereas Vermont didn't have as much granite, so they really developed into an agricultural community. So if we kind of fast forward to the present day, like we see how Ag Vermont has really developed as an agricultural community based on the soils and the watersheds, but now we're in a time where we need to, um, you know, we need to create more jobs in our economy, and we need to um, create healthier soil or he I'm sorry, healthier foods for us. So we can create healthier communities, and so by really thinking about all the ways that we're producing, or we're creating opportunities locally we're benefiting our local economy. And right now with Act 148, we're in this huge transformative time where the local um, municipalities and school districts and townships are really gonna have to start thinking of how to utilize this research, or this um, re, uh, re, what was I say? <laughs> resource, so that um, we can be benefiting our local communities. So right now, for instance, um, a yard of compost goes for anywhere from like 35 to $75 a yard. And this is something that we all need to be able to, even if we're not um, growers or farmers ourselves, our local farmers need this resource to be able to grow healthy foods for our communities. So you can really start to make the connections between soil health and community health. Um, and so, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that with the um, implications of Act 148, but I really want to help make those connections between how our local economy is impacted by our soils. Um, so number eight, the other reason why we compost is just because it's fun. You know, I work with kids in an after-school program, and we started a composting system at the school there. And it's amazing um, to, to use just the compost pile as a classroom in itself, because there's so much that happens. And any one aspect of composting can contribute to a, a litany of, of lessons. And um, it also really encourages the process of discovery, because any opportunity that we get to kind of like shine a light or, or, or look through a lens um, at, at the cycle of life, um, you know, we get to see how, what, what is really going on here, and then we, we don't take it for granted as much and might make, you know, decisions that are more, more benefiting to our, ourselves and our communities. So, and that, so that's eight of the reasons, but I know there's many more, um, and obviously you guys have already identified some of your own reasons for composting, which is why you're here today. Um, so there's a number of ways to compost, and we're going to go into just some of the building blocks of compost, compost piles and how to encourage that, um, that rich uh, material that we all know and love. So some of the basic ingredients are, um, are food scraps. And in general, um, most guides that you'll see say, you know, all organic matter or all organic materials can be composted. Um, but kind of as a rule of thumb, it, it, depending on the size of your pile, it's good to keep um, dairy and also meat out of the compost. And the primary reason for that is that like things like cheese and yogurt, they, they are more of an oily substance. So it takes longer to break down and it can really shift the, um, the not only the speed, but the quality of compost that you might get because of those oils. Um, another reason is that it draws, um, you know, any number of different animals to your compost pile. So uh, depending on how, um, 
you know, how much you want to be interacting with the wildlife, I would say, you know, it's a good idea to kind of keep meat and dairy out of the compost. Um, but again, depending on the size. So, um, as I was saying before, carbon is really the building block of all life. So, it, we also require carbon in order to break down carbon. Um, so, the ideal ratio of any compost pile is based on your carbon and nitrogen. And um, that ratio is 30 to 1, um, 30 parts carbon to 1 part nitrogen. And um, so when you're designing your compost pile, you really want to make sure that you have enough of the carbon because food scraps is a byproduct of our, our lifestyle. So we often, and food scraps could be considered um, a nitrogen source. So we want to make sure that we have enough of a carbon source to help break down that nitrogen source. Um, so I always recommend collecting leaf matter um, just from your yard and your neighbor's yard. I, I don't recommend going into the woods and raking leaves because um, of course we know that the, uh, the importance of leaf matter on the forest floor is, is really valuable. Um, so we want to be leaving those sources. Um, straw can be a good source of carbon for compost piles. Um, you can buy straw by the bale. It's getting up to $12 or $15 a bale. Um, so depending on the size, that might be an affordable option for you or it might not be. Um, but when if you're using straw, you want to make sure to use straw and not hay. And the basic difference is just that hay still has the seed head on it, whereas straw is the stalk of, of a grain. Um, and one of the reasons why it's a great resource for composting is because it's hollow. So another really important ingredient in making and creating compost is air. So um, straw provides a nice fibrous carbon material, but it also allows some air into the pile. Um, what else? Oh, small woody debris. Um, you know, sometimes if I'm uh, cutting, you know, about this time of year, we start to see a lot of stalks on our perennial gardens and um, you can cut those stalks. So like things like angelica or columbine stalks, um, things that might be a little bit more woody but aren't like big branches, you can put those in your compost pile too. And um, that will also effectively um, bring in some air. Um, so moisture is also really important. And um, what I say here is like the moisture of like a wrung out sponge. So you don't want it too wet and like drippy and moist and you don't want it too dry. And the reason for that is we're really trying to create an ideal situation for the bacteria to break down compost. So all of these ingredients and methods are to create an ideal environment for the microbes, which are really the ones that are doing the work. Um, so air, water, carbon, and nitrogen. And that's it. That's basically what you need. Um, so when you're thinking of the size of your pile, um, Basically, what you want to do is create a large enough of a volume to maximize the heat. And what that does is it encourages what's called thermophilic bacteria, which are bacteria that are heat loving, that do a lot of the uh, breaking down of the organic matter. So um, what, what has been found to be an ideal size is say like a four by four volume pile. And there's a number of different ways to create that size. Um, it sounds like we have a couple of different models of, of, of compost um, setups here, um, but you can just create a pile, a freestanding pile, about four by four. There's a bin system that works pretty effectively. Um, I, I recommend using pallets. They're already the, the size um, that we want, so we can put those together really easily. Um, or there's like the turning kind of bins. And I can really be guided by your questions or just go over you know, which ones I like best, but people have different preferences based on uh, what works for your lifestyle. Um, but the idea is, is to get a, a necessary volume and to have all of those ingredients and um, the, the proper heat in order to um, encourage the bacteria and then also kill off any pathogens and or weed seeds that might be in your compost pile. So the, as the process begins, um, there's a certain um, type of bacteria that will come and start decomposing all the aggregates and, 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 um, and organic matter. And with the byproduct of that process is heat. 
So we have the mesophilic bacteria that first colonizes the pile, and then that encourages the thermophilic bacteria, which are only present when your pile reaches a certain heat. So um, that temperature is around 130 to 140 degrees. And you can tell there's a progression that your pile will follow. Um, as you put your materials together, it'll slowly increase in heat and then it'll maximize at between 130 and 140. And then it reaches a plateau and then it starts to go down again. So basically what that means is the bacteria have done all the work that they can do to decompose all the food that is there. So uh, in order to create a finished product, what you would do at that point is to turn your pile, which is effectively adding more air, which is more food to that bacteria. And then they'll start working again and bring the temperature back up once more. And then once it starts to decrease, you'll notice that your pile looks more of that like crumbly, kind of sometimes yeah, moist, barky kind of material. And then that is when you know you have a finished product. Um, yeah. Is there a way for me to really identify when it's time to turn my pile, when that climax has happened and it's on the remaining side? Yeah, that's a good question. So did everyone hear the question? She said, is there a way to visu visibly tell if the compost is complete um, without taking the temperature? And yes, there is. You don't have to get a thermometer. It's, it's actually a pretty affordable um, purchase, but I just get a compost from, I think it's like $14. But, um, but it is really valuable just to be able to visually tell too. And um, what, you know, if your pile, I would say roughly four to six weeks is probably the, if you have your pile sitting and it's been four to six weeks, by turning it, it'll increase air, increase microbes. Yeah, so it doesn't have, depend on if your pile's in the shade or in the sun. And, I mean, time, if, it's, it's, it's tricky. It, yeah, there's no like, and hard and fast rule. Yeah. But, but generally like, speaking, if you have a four by four pile, yep. and even if it's in the shade, what's gonna be creating the heat is the, is the bacteria and the microorganisms. So, and you have the ratio of three to And you have that ratio. And I can talk more about how to create that ratio too. You don't have to be getting out your scale or anything. But, um, so generally speaking, it would be six to eight weeks. And, but if you turn, the, the, the thing is, is that there's no, there's no harm in turning your pile sooner than that amount because the more air that it's getting, the faster it's breaking down. So if you love turning your compost pile, like I was working on a farm one time and it was just a part of our regular chores to do all the time. And we, we mostly liked doing it because you really get to see the process then you know, you're gonna get a finished product much faster. Um, there's a lot to say on the subject, but let me take this question and I'll keep going. Uh, so at my school, we have a really big compost turner and it's probably been there for a couple of years. Uh -huh. And it just sort of, we've never really emptied it. Uh -huh. And there's like a little bit of dust on the ground. Should we turn it now in the fall or should I just empty it all together and try to turn it over a bit? You've never emptied it? No. Yeah, I would empty it. Um, okay, and, and just start back. Yeah, and then see how the material is in the pile. And maybe put it into, if it's not finished, put it into its own pile and add a little bit of, you know, leaves or straw and turn it a couple times. Um, but what you could do is once you have a finished product, what that is, is that, that um, like you could take a handful of that, which is effectively an inoculant. So just a handful of your finished compost will have all the bacteria that you need to start a new pile. So I would just leave some in the bin and then start adding again. Um, and then as you add, you know, the ratio is 30 to 1, and that's a, um, a ratio based on volume. But I, what I found is that you can also really get that ratio if you have a pile. And say you have a bin or a wire mesh, you know, square. You're adding your layer of food scraps. Maybe you bring your bucket out um, once a week, and you sprinkle it all on top of that pile. And then add a layer, double that depth in carbonous material. And, and that is generally speaking enough to get that 30 to one ratio. And it doesn't have to be, it could, you know, three to one or two to one. If it's three to one, I would turn it a little bit more, but you could just do a, just do a layering system. And then once you have it stacked, you can let it sit, you know, for about four to six to eight weeks, and then, and then turn it. Does and that make sense? Do you, what do you consider dry grass? Carbon or carbon? Nitrogen or carbon? If you use it while it's green, it's yeah. nice to draw. Dry as carbon. Okay. Yeah. So, but what I do recommend is if you want a really fertile compost, because 
Once we get into the um, nuances of the compost, we can talk about the mineral content of each of the different ingredients. Because mm -hmm. you really want to be maximizing the fertility in your compost so that it really adds to your garden. So what I would do and what I would recommend is adding the green grass clippings, provided it is not treated. Right. And then add the green and then make sure you add enough carbon because that, because uh, as we know, green grass clippings are very moist. So make sure you're adding up and then you'll be getting all of that recycled um, nitrogen. Yep. And then if you let it dry out on your lawn and then rake it as dry, that's fine too, but you're losing some nutrients that yeah. you could otherwise really benefit from. Yep. Um, but that's a great question because it starts out as nitrogen and then changes to carbon after it loses, just through the process of breaking down. Karen, two yep. questions. So yeah. if you wanted to raise the temperature of your uh, compost pile, um, I've been covering it when yeah. it's been so hot with an old shower curtain that's clear. Oh, oh, interesting. Okay. But not keeping it on there permanently because then it'll rot. Right. Is and the other question is: is the um, presence of earthworms indicative of the quality of your compost? Uh, yes. So that. Yeah, when earthworms are present, that means that they've, the cycle has moved for, through the tiny little microorganism stage into the, from the, the mesophilic to the thermophilic. Because the larger the organism that you see, it means that there's a, more, a higher quantity of smaller organisms that they're able to eat. And then once you get to that stage, the byproduct of the worm, of course, is the worm casting. So, and we need to study this more, but the worms are so, earthworms are so incredible because they have this special bacteria in their guts that are able to kind of produce a, a byproduct that is just tremendous for soil building. So, so to answer your second question, yes, that means that there's some good stuff going on there. Um, and to cover the compost, it is important in certain circumstances, if, it's, if we're getting a lot of rain and it's too moist, then I would recommend covering it. And if it's drying out, you can always control the amount of moisture that you get when if you hose it down. So like if you turn the pile and you notice that it's really dry, get out your hose and hose it down a little bit. Um, the clear covering is a question, to, is an interesting question for me to ponder too because, you know, I would wonder whether that it's gonna, it's gonna heat it too much and then kill off some of the things, you know, some of the yeah. bacteria. Um, I usually recommend covering with a dark plastic, um, but if you're looking to really kind of heat the pile, then you could like keep it on there for a little while and then take it off. Um, I, I've never tried that, so I don't know specifically, but I, I would have, it would definitely raise the heat of the pile. You might just run the risk of raising it a little bit too much. Okay. Yeah. So if you have a giant worm in your compost, it's a good sign. It is a good sign. If it's like six inches long. Yeah. And then if I transplant that worm to my garden, is that better? Because it's got the task and that yeah. and it can fertilize my garden while it's Definitely. Yep, I would take worms from your compost pile. Well, you should see, like, at that point, if you have those big worms in your compost pile, it, it could be anywhere between part and fully broken, fully way broken down. So you would be adding the worms, but you don't have to set, you just add them as compost. So, like, take your shovels of compost and put them in your garden at that point. Yeah. And then, um, you know, and then you'll have the worms and the compost. Yeah. If there are cockroaches in your compost pile, is that a bad sign because the stuff is as the food isn't broken down then? Well, that's just a sign you're in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You must be in New York City. Yeah. It is a sign that the, a sign that the food isn't breaking down. Okay. Because they're they're it's being like dropped. The yeah, sort of. yeah. It means that one, you can, you need to cover it better, or like if you, and this is the other thing. Like in the country, you can have really effective composting systems that are like three bins that are open. You know, maybe they're along your forest edge or along your garden, and not worry about it too much. But in the city, we're going to be talking about different systems that are really sealed and tight, where things can't get in. But you have, but then that means that you have to work a little bit harder to making it to be more of a controlled environment with these ideal. Um, circumstances um, but you would you would want to then my first move would be to bring in more organic material with the cock you know like the like the leaves and the straw um, you know and see and, and maybe the moisture you know see what what those different um, elements are you have to work with yeah Do you ever add manure to the yeah 
Yeah, um, a, it's, a, it's a manure is a wonderful source of nitrogen. It's almost a pure source depending on what animal it's coming from. Um, and it, it, that will also effectively raise the heat of your pile. Um, but you just want to make sure that it's all broken down by the time that you're applying it to your garden. And the main reason there is that uh, a manure source is a, is a hot source and it could burn seeds. So in one setting, in the compost pile, it's really effective if burning weed seeds. But in your garden, it might not be so effective because you want, of course, your carrots and your radishes to all germinate. So, um, but yeah, I would, I would add, uh, and I would make sure it's nicely mixed in and make sure there's enough of other carbon because that's a nitrogen source. Um, there's other really wonderful things to add to your compost pile to make sure that it is getting, um, you know, really maximizing the fertility that you're bringing to your gardens. Um, a wonderful plant is called comfrey and it's an amazing perennial. It spreads very aggressively, but the uh, nutrient content in the leaves <coughs> are, are amazing. So what you can do is you can get three or four cuttings off of a comfrey plant a year. So what I recommend doing is what's called chopping and either dropping as a direct mulch on your garden or putting it in big piles to your uh, compost. Um, and so any kind of weeds or anything that you're pulling from your garden before they go to seed um, can go right in your compost pile. Um, manure, like you said, is great. Um, other amendments are what's called rock phosphate. And um, that basically provides a substrate for soil aggregates to bind to. So, and it's, a, it's like a rock dust powder and you can sprinkle it like salt and pepper in your pile. So you're just, again, creating more um, opportunities for soil life, bacteria, microorganisms to, to bind to and then What's do what they do. Rock. rock phosphate. Is it like azomite? It is. Oh. Yep, it is exactly. Okay. And what yeah. about wood? Um, wood ash. Ash. Yep. Yeah. It's the, just sprinkled again, like salt and pepper. Yeah, the wood ash is a high source of phosphorus. Right. So. And potassium. And potassium, which is the potash. Yeah. So um, you can add it to your piles. It can also, in, in some vegetables, it really depends on what you want to use your compost for too. So for instance, potatoes really need a lot of potassium and phosphorus. So I would add the wood ash either to my potato ditches or to the compost as it, itself, um, but not in excessive amounts. No, just, I'm, I mean lightly like spread. Yeah, like absolutely. Yeah, I think it's a good source. And it's also a carbon source. Right. So, um, although it's funny because sometimes I notice that wood ash can actually more effectively um, keep moisture as opposed to drying things mm -hmm. up so it has the so like whereas other carbon you would add to take up the moisture you have to be a little bit more careful with wood chip or i'm not sorry wood chips uh wood ash because it will it'll kind of like seal mm -hmm. your pile and then moisture will kind of you know happen in your pile and you need it to aerate more so just make sure you're really sprinkling it Truly and really sprinkle. mixing it right yeah what so, about sawdust or wood chips um sawdust is a wonderful source of carbon um, you know, it's in its it's in its very primary stages before being broken down, um, but except that there's a, a large amount of surface area. So the smaller a particle is, the more surface area there is. And anytime there's more surface area, it means we're providing more habitat for all that bacteria and those organisms. So I think um, the only thing that we want to make sure of when we're if we're sourcing sawdust is that it's not from plywood. It doesn't have any glues. Um, and is also that it's, we have to be a little bit careful with certain species. Pine, of course, is acidic. So um, we, don't, we only wanna be using that in smaller amounts. Um, also some, the juglone, so that if there's a, the nut trees, um, have a bacteria that makes them what's called allelopathic, and that can suppress um, the growth of other things. How about oak? Does oak have that as well, that property? Not that I've heard of. Okay. It's not to say that it might seems be in small strong. amounts, but it's, it seems like a strong kind of wood. But um, I mostly and I know of the juglones, which are the you know butternuts. Um, I just know I just know we have a lot of oak around, and and certain perennials, including asparagus and and perennial flowers, do not do well if they're in close proximity to the oak. To the oak. Interesting. Yeah, I mean and to the oak root. Yeah. You know, 
They might have a little bit of the allelopathic yeah. qualities. Yeah. Does anyone know? Anyone else in the... the walnut, walnut is in the well, that's a well, and walnut, yeah, walnuts are the jug loan, and yeah. The, yeah, they are really effective at limiting growth. I mean, I've seen things like pachysandra really thrive around walnuts, so there's probably certain things that you know will like more of that, you know, whatever it, that bacteria that it is is putting out. Could you tell us like a top five list of readily? I mean, you've given us three, and you've given us sawdust, but yeah. your top five or ten list of readily available carbon um, sources. Uh, so I would the number one source would be leaf yeah, leaf right. Um because worms love them they break down easily if you can get them into like a little home scale chipper or run your lawnmower over them a little bit that'll be even better because again you're breaking it up and creating more surface mm -hmm. area um, and then you know depending on what resources you have available like straw because it doesn't have the weeds mm -hmm. it is hollow so it has that air. Um, yeah, sawdust can be good. Wood chips are, you know, can be used if you don't have other things. It's but because it's um, you know, it'll just take longer to break down. So you'll have a ratio of breakdown that's a little bit different in your pile. So you'll, you, in one sense, you might get, you know, and I don't know what the exact ratio is, but maybe you get a bucket of compost and you'll have to throw another bucket of wood chips back in the compost pile, which isn't the worst case scenario. I mean, if you're turning your pile, you're harvesting your compost. And then you just throw some of your wood chips back as an inoculant into the next one. That's not a bad thing. Oh, good. Oh, nice. Oh, but they both have so worms. Is this the mulch one? That's the one over where we dump our paint. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So we have a couple of different ones that we can look at. Here, Karen, you can um, spread it over. And this one is from where I was? You can dump it on here. And that one's from down below, this wood chip that Jim has sort of dumped on that pile for many years. Um, and then this is from the other. Or this, this is the is further one we want to sift at some point to make our soil. Yeah, so this is, a, thank you so much for collecting these. Yeah. So this is actually a really great example because here's one, so as wood chips can, you know, you can add them to your compost pile, but it'll take longer to break down. Um, the, here is a wonderful example because one of the byproducts of this business, of course, is wood chips, which is why you see that we utilize them in all these different ways. Um, so just by putting them in a big pile and letting them kind of break down and do their natural thing, they're going to start breaking down. Like just as I started out by saying, life really naturally breaks down and decomposes and, and recycles itself. So here's, a, here's like one stage of that development. And you can see, and I'll even pass around a little clump and you can touch it and feel it and see like what the difference is. And then I'll pass around this one and we can talk about what the differences is, differences are and then um, how, to, you know, how to really get this material versus this material. Um, Karen? Yeah. Um, pressure treated wood sawdust should be avoided? Yeah, always, yeah. Yeah, because they, I can't, I think they were using arsenic at one point for pressure treated wood. And, um, you know, it just like I was talking a little bit about what I call like the front end and the back end of social change, like the more that we're limiting what we're using that has been heavily treated, the more that we don't have to worry about how we're going to be dealing with it. And ideally, everything in our lives will be able to be either recycled or composted, which is why, again, this law has come into effect. But, um, At what stage are these two products? Are, are those ready to go on there? Um, they, uh, they need a little bit more of a breakdown process. So this is probably three or four years old. Maybe more, Jim, on that pile. But I'm on the surface, and it's a very, very large pile. So our goal is to dig into the pile and start sifting it. And then we'll test it. Yeah. And then add what it is we would need to add to make it the soil that we now use. Yeah. Yeah, so, so like what Sylvia was saying, like so what we would do with this pile in the next phases would be to add some of the rock phosphate, maybe add some comfrey, you know, some other things just to finish it off and really bring the nutrients so that we know when we're using it that it has like a complete microbiome of nutrients that can really build the soil and contribute to the plant health. Um, so now we'll pass around a little bit of this pile and I'm gonna get back to the carbon question too because I know that there's, there's like four or five that we've talked about and it is one of the largest problems in creating both small and large scale composting operations. Like the state is in a situation right now where they're working with municipalities to figure out 
how they're going to get the quantity of carbon they need to be able to recycle the amount of um, nitrogen in the form of food scraps that we're going to be having to really break down. Right. So without depleting our forests, okay. without depleting our forests. So I mean, it's really a good question, and it's a it's a very valuable dialogue to have because um, you know we're we're going to really see a, a high need for that kind of thing. So. You know, so I guess in some ways wood chips might not be the ideal thing to add to a small home, com home composting system. Eventually we're going to, you know, we're, we'll have to be using everything that we can get in the form of carbon. I've started using um, brown paper bags when I go shopping. I mean, I usually don't use bags at all, but because I have a use, because I live in an apartment complex and we have a small bin composting outside, I have no leaf sources on the property that I am on to collect. So I rip paper bag strips and add them to the compost pile. What about newspapers? Um, newspapers can be used as well, and they, they break down great. Um, if I What I do like to reserve my newspaper sources for is for sheet mulching, and we can talk a little bit about that later, but ultimately it does get back into the soil food web. Yeah. And all newspapers now are using soy-based inks, so we don't really have to worry about that. I just recommend not using the glossy or the waxy kind, um, but it's wonderful because basically our recycling stream, and I'll get into talking a little bit more about this with Act 148, but currently as it stands, there are other countries, primarily China, that recognizes our um, recyclable waste as a, as a commodity. So all of these, so these um, recycle, recyclables are being bought up in mass quantities um, from China, and then they you know, reappropriate it into something and sell it back to us. So, and as you read, if you look on to any of the UVM, um, you know, master composting or universal recycling law information, they really do state it as a commodity. And we're a little bit behind the game here in the United States, or, you know, just thinking about how are we really using these products? And we live in such a disposable society that we've almost removed ourselves from thinking cradle to grave with, with this stuff. So it's really important to start shifting the way that we think about things. So, um, you know, and I approach composting in this community from a needs-based perspective. Like, I'm a gardener, and I know that there's, a, there's a, a, a price tag on the compost that I need to be bringing into my garden. So as much as I'm making myself, is saving me money. It's sequestering carbon. It's creating biodiversity. You know, it's benefiting the environment. Like, there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing this. Um, but anyway, you can see easily how it gets, like, spiraled out into all these different things. And how we can really change a lot just by composting. So, which kind of paper? This kind of paper, well, we use post-consumer paper. I, we, we did try to print it on double-sided. We're having a little printer, you know. No, but I mean, in your home. Oh, you're talking about recycling. I'm like, oh, God. Uh, right. <laughs> no, no, because we, well, anyway, we have a home office, and we shred a lot of paper, and we take it to the recycling. Compost it. All right. And then, so, but the other thing is, so it involves, you know, with every action that we do, we should be clear on what we're, what we're doing it for. And what I would recommend is, um, you know, making sure that the source of your paper is like a post-consumer content. Okay. And the other thing, as like really engaged citizens and educated consumers, we need to be holding these companies accountable. So, and you know, without getting too much on a tangent, I have worked um, on this campaign to get post-consumer content into paper because we don't know this, but a lot of catalogs, a lot of junk mail, the source of that pulp is coming from virgin forests. And there is research, there's an incredible organization called Forest Ethics, and they really were a huge proponent in getting FSC, which is the Forest Stewardship Council Certified Wood, and it's different than SFI, which is Sustainable Forest Initiative, which is not a third-party certification. It's an industry-sponsored certification that doesn't actually really practice sustainable forest practices. But anyway, it's so important that like once we start thinking about using this in our gardens, of course, we're like, well, what is in it and how do we find out? We need to be putting pressure on the companies to, to be using less chemicals in all aspects of their process. So post-consumer, you mean like recycled? Recycled, yeah. And it is, we did, with the, with the campaign that we were working on, we did successfully get 30% post-consumer, which is a start, but it's only a small start. But if we, I mean, if we don't know about that, then, yeah. Yeah. If you get a shredder, I would start composting it, and I would avoid waxy things because we're not really certain what's in there. Um, if you can find soy bank, soy based inks for your printers, I think I highly recommend that. Just getting as natural as you can, and then. Um, 
And then in the meantime, what we need to be doing also is like the High Fields Institute, UVM, charter schools, wherever the, in, the research can take place, um, is after the, oh, Elaine Ingram is an incredible resource and she's doing a lot of research out in Oregon State University, but is testing the compost uh, after it, it breaks mm -hmm. down. Yeah. Because if we're using this paper, that's really the only way that we can put our stamp of approval on the quality of the content is if we're testing it after we after it breaks down. Mm -hmm. Because what we do know about chemicals is that they, they can um, bioaccumulate. And so like all things that are made from life or organic materials naturally decompose in the soil and all like there's no waste in nature. It all gets utilized. But if we have chemicals, those don't they're not life forms, so they can't decompose, so they bioaccumulate and then we have to figure out what to do with that. So um you know, it's a it's a really important inquiry and, and a process to be going through. But I say shred the paper, use it in your compost. You know, see what kind of a product you're getting, and um, in the very least, what you're doing is helping to um, divert those things from the landfill. And um, you know, and the and the just the the, in, the incredible energy that's used to to create these things and then to just you know uh, throw these things out like. I don't know about you guys, I go check my mail every week and I get a handful of uh, junk mail. I know that a lot of that comes from Virgin Forest. It goes directly back into the waste stream. It's one of the most inefficient processes that we have. Anyway, I, I don't want to get too much into that, but um, it's, a really, it's really important to be aware of and it's really important to be putting pressure on these companies to say they should be using 100% post-consumer content for that stuff. Um, Okay, off the show back, back to the compost. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna pass around some of this and just notice the difference in, in and you can see already, it's a little more crumbly. Um, it's, so this is a more of a finished product. So what we know about this product is it's, 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 it's less finished. Um, we could add the rock phosphate, um, straw, food scraps, Ooh, turn it a couple Amazing. of more times. Thank you. And then, um, you know, and then get it to this kind of, a, which is, so once it's, if it's incomplete and, we add, and we're adding it to our gardens, it's instead of providing all that nutrients for the plant material, the process of breaking down, it might take that from the plant material. So we really want to be adding a complete material to our gardens so that it's not, you know, um, depleting a plant that really needs those nutrients. So when it's composted, those bacteria and microorganisms have done their job really completely and are making that nutrient more accessible to the plant. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's like the difference of, you know, and I recommend eating raw vegetables. They really help to clean our intestinal tracts. We get a lot of um, food from them. In Chinese medicine, they recommend lightly steaming the vegetables. That helps to bring out the sugars and make the nutrients more accessible to us. That's like the difference of the composting. We want that we want to expend less energy for maximum nutrient. It's the same way that we look at our compost. When it's more finished, the plants are able to uptake more nutrient in a, in a um, you know, a more efficient way. And um, so, and also, I noticed that in this one, you might not be able to see it from over there, but there's all these like little strings and hairs, and with that is the mycelium. So the mycelium are like the highways that transfer the nutrients from the soil to the plant. And they're all the little root hairs that actually do most of the work of digestion for the plants. Mm -hmm. So the roots are like our digestive system for the plant. And then it takes it up into its um, you know, stem and the leaves and then it's able to really do its photosynthesizing and, and fruit and seed production the best that it can. Um, so, and as you can see, what's similar in these two piles is that there's a tremendous amount of woody material. So this is where the wood material should go. And I, I, I do use wood chips in my pathways in my gardens. And then I try to use a lighter, less dense carbon material for the mulching on the top. Um, you know, and that seems to work pretty well. All right, I, I seem to have gotten off the handout a little bit, but I, I love your questions and please keep asking them as we go along. Um, yeah. How do you test for proper nutritional balance in the pile? Is there any simple way to do it at home, or do you have to send it away? You know, there are, test kits? There are soil test kits, and we've invested in some here at Henderson's, and we, can, we can't we can necessarily um, identify the micro and the macronutrients, but we can tell how viable it is based on the organisms that are present. 
So even just as simple as looking through a microscope and seeing what organisms are present, we can tell where the maturity of the pile is. Um, so with just a microscope, you can do a lot. And, but as far as getting the micro and the macronutrients, like the way that I was able to do that back in high school was with the process of what's called electrophoresis. And what you do is you have to burn it into a ash and then you send light through the ash to figure out what nutrient is, is present. So Dartmouth has an electrophoresis system. If we all you know, become you know, citizen scientists, hopefully we can open the doors to the universities and get them to do research for the public good. And I recommend that we all do that. Um, until we have our home electrophoresis system, we're gonna rely on the universities. But, um, but again, this is a huge growing field. Like there's a lot of people that are wrapping their minds around um, how to keep these nutrients recycling instead of going to the landfill. So, um, so there's some things that we can do at home. And also the, the more familiar that you get with the process of composting, the more you'll be able to look at two piles and really be able to assess. And if you have a pile like this and you know that you're adding comfrey and rock phosphate and like manure, you have all the proper ingredients to really create the ideal nutrients. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the size of the pile, you know, basically four by four. I've talked a little bit about there's both cold and hot composting. Hot composting happens a lot faster because every time heat is um, uh, put off as a, byproduct of the decomposition, it creates more environment for more thermophilic bacteria, thus more digesting. Um, so that's aerobic composting. There's also anaerobic composting, which is that without air, and it takes a lot longer for, um, for the pro process to break down and to, great, to get a finished compost product. Um, but the, where you see um, anaerobic composting is in areas where there's a tremendous amount of either carbon or nitrogen and people are creating like big wind rows that become harder and harder to turn more readily. So it's just layering um, and then it just breaks down like it would in the forest floor. There's other um, systems where people will dig trenches in the ground and add raw food scraps and layer there and then just leave it. And that would also be considered an anaerobic composting because you're not turning to create to um, you know a situation for the aerobic bacteria to come in and do the work that they're doing. How long do they have to trench? Um, if you train, you know, probably like a full season, um, you know, being meaning a full growing season, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. Whereas your turning pile, you get a finished product in like six to eight weeks. So it just depends on what you need it for. And if you're yeah. looking to just divert or to actually harvest those nutrients. You had like raised bed, like one bed each year that was your compost. compost. Pile. That, that. Yeah, that could work. Um, it, you would have to compromise the use of the bed to make the compost. So it depends on how much you want to grow. Um, and if you're, but I, you could, and the, well, the other concern I have with that is like maybe not getting the full amount of volume that you would need to break it down. So like, I guess the question essentially is if you had a raised bed, could you put your raw food scraps in there and then wait a season and get compost? And in some ways you, you could do that, but you, you might not have the volume of food scraps or nitrogen to carbon to really effectively break it down. Um, and you would have to sacrifice one of your beds every year to that process. So where I would recommend making, you know, squishing the rectangle to a square, raising it up a little bit and then just doing it next to your bed. So, yeah, and then the temperature, I've started, I've talked about that. So once the pile, so you can either get a thermometer or, um, you know, or just, you know, really the, um, to tell where the, with the progression of your pile is, like if it's reached its maximum bacteria capacity, it will reach 130, 140, reach a plateau, and then start to um, drop down again. Or you can just test the pile by way of um, looking. It shouldn't smell bad. If you smell something putrid or uh, like pond, swampy, gunky stuff, it means that it's too wet and you would wanna turn it and then get some really good carbon sources in there. Um, sometimes in the process of my turning, I've experimented with using uh, perforated PVC pipes 
So one time we had a pile and it was a lot of sheep manure and it was a lot of food scraps and they were in two separate places and we said, okay, we want to combine these sources and make it into a windrow. We didn't have the mechanization to be able to turn it. So we made it like a four foot high by like 10 foot um, long row and we put long perforated PVC pipes so that on the ends there was an air circulation and it, and it worked pretty well. Um, so, and we only had to really turn it once. So it's, it wasn't a complete time or energy suck and it, it got produced a really good um, compost. Um, so the other ways that you can tell if you have a finished product, so smelling, you know, feeling like this, you can tell it feels and it smells a little bit more earthy, like that, uh, like that humus that you would smell in, in, the, in the forest floor. You know, this is a little bit more, um, you know, it's clay. It's still, it's still sticking together when I, when I bring it in my hands. And um, so it's not, it's not a completely composted product. Uh, the color is another indicator. This looks a little bit more like soil, whereas this looks a little bit more like clay. Um, and so really just the presence of air can create a nice environment for bacteria to do their thing. Um, so visible, so we can check by visible inspection, by feeling it, by smelling it. Um, you know, you can test it, you can taste it. <laughs> They're now coming out with all this research connecting soil health to gut health, which is no surprise to me really, um, because I, now you know we've come to understand the benefits of probiotics things that are in yogurt but there's also a litany of other bacteria that are really good for our gut health um, what we're finding in the soil is that it's called prebiotics and if the presence of prebiotics in our gut help us to fend off allergies and increase our immunity so you know they say that a handful of soil maybe keeps the doctor away now <laughs> I don't know, you know, like, I'll, I guess maybe I wouldn't eat soil directly, but, you know, like, if you're pulling your carrot fresh from your garden, you know, you can just rub it off and eat it. You don't have to worry about making it super, super clean. Um, and I, and I, there's a tremendous amount of bacteria that really benefit our gut health. Um, so there's all those ways to inspect um, the pile to see, you know, are there, are there big, big aggregates or the smaller aggregates? Are there worms involved? If there's worms, you're, you know, you're well on your way. Um, to having a nice compost pile. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit now about like the different systems. Um, my favorite is a three bin system, by four by four, you strap some pallets together. Um, you have one, one of the bins, you can store your carbon material. In order to be composting year round, we really have to be storing carbon all year long. Um, so keep your pile full of carbon. You know, in your middle bin, you can have maybe you're actively adding to your to that compost so you're able to bring the carbon right from next to your bin you put it down you add your food scraps you add your carbon you add your food scraps you add your carbon and then you let that pile um and then when that pile i'm sorry when that pile is full what you do is you turn it into your third bin so you're incorporating the air you're pushing it into its next level of decomposition and then you're freeing up a new bin that already has the inoculant that you need of bacteria to start your new composting. Um, you could even add a fourth bin to, to, so then you can sequentially be turning because of course once your carbon has been put into your second bin to be breaking down, you have a new bin to be adding carbon. So does that progression kind of make sense? You have this way that you're moving things along and then when it's in your third bin, you, it should be able to go right from there into your garden or in your perennials or around your fruit trees um, so I like that because I like to be able to access compost I like to be able to look at it and inspect it I find that the bins and I have used the bins um, but I, I find that it's harder to really get in and see what's going on and um, but they do work especially in city settings or in rural neighborhoods and at the local elementary school we did a three bin system and we also have a 55 gallon drum that's on a that's situated um, on a, a, a setup that you can that turns and so I do that because it helps to keep the critters out and the kids really love to have like big things to push and turn and open so you know you can always have volunteer oh, who wants to open the bin today and who wants to turn the bin and so it helps them to get more engaged um, and they tend to like things to work with instead of you know just like a pitchfork <laughs> um, but what I found is the process of the three bin system really helps to break down the pile faster. Um, I don't have it covered 
and that seems to be fine. The moisture that we get adds a the nice amount of moisture for the decomposition process, and I'm able to you know store a lot of leaves that I need. Um, the, the the turning system. So there's one that's a it's a bin. It's a 55 gallon drum, and you kind of turn it uh, you know head over end. Um, there's also big barrel systems that have like a hand crank and you know a little um, what's it called like a gear system where you can easily turn a large volume because of the the introduction of the gears and um, that can work too. Um, you just need to make sure that your ratio is right. And I have seen and I've heard of compost being turned over you know three to five weeks. You can get a finished product because usually if you're turning like this, you're turning more often than if you're having to pitch. Um, and so that's the kind of system that I would probably progress into as I, um, you know, don't want to be, you know, working so hard on my, my lower back, but it all depends on how you use your body, really. Um, yeah. So you don't keep adding food scraps to the active pad? You just keep those somewhere? Yeah, so once you get your volume of 4x4, four four, uh, you would not add anymore and just let it start to break down. It's a really good question. Mm -hmm. so, and then you would be adding your fresh food scraps to a new pile. Um, and then if you're adding raw scraps to a pile that's already started to reach its 130, it's gonna take a little bit longer to break. It'll be just in different stages. So, and that's not really a problem if you have a sifter, you know, and, you're, and, you're, and you have a bin system and you're just able to pitch the stuff that's not quite broken down into your other pile. Um, it just depends on the system that you have. Uh, but yeah, once you reach your maximum volume and your um, ingredient mix, then you would stop adding to that pile and then create a new pile. Karen, yeah. will you talk about uh, accelerants for your compost pile? Is fish emulsion food? Yeah, um, you know, a you know, way to accelerate it is by incorporating heat, which could be, you could use fish emulsion. It's, it's a very strong, it would be a strong product and I would fear that some of those nutrients and stuff would get lost as applied as opposed to just using the fish emulsion in a water solution and watering, watering. your plants. Um, it, it's just, you would, I would apply it, you know, on the vegetable part unless the, but by heating it, so like if you had um, uh, grass clippings, you could add grass clippings to your pile and that would increase and, and, and um, increase the speed and breakdown. Um, horse any, manure. Yeah, horse manure would do it. Like a pure nitrogen source, I would say, would do it. Yeah. Also turning. Okay, because every anytime you're turning, you're bringing those um, aerobic, I'm sorry, ana no, aerobic microbes. Yeah. What yes, Jim? about um, waste treatment sludge? Is that acceptable to use in your compost? I, no. No, I, well, there is, so, on a large scale, there's sludge that's being used on in, in industrial agricultural systems. Um, I think that that is, I think it's like treated heavily with chemicals. I'm not exactly sure what the process is, but I think they treat it with chemicals to kill any like, um, you know, pathogens. So it's 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 like it's like a incomplete way of utilizing it, what could be a very valuable resource. The way to use um, human waste and recycle that is through the process of humanure which is a well-researched process. Um, a lot of people are just, you know, pooping in buckets and then adding it to um, uh, sawdust or straw and then letting that sit. The state regulation is it needs to sit for at least five years in a pile and then it can be applied to like fruit trees and perennial gardens. Um, even though I believe that it's a safe enough product to add to your vegetable garden after five years, I've worked with it personally. I've looked at it, it's an incredible product. Um, it's, it's, you, we cannot legally apply it to vegetable gardens because it's too close to contact with the part that we eat. But fruit trees and all that, it's a great source for. You know, because we're still a little uncomfortable about talking about our bodily functions with each other, sometimes it's a little bit of a sketchy process or, to or topic to bring up around the dinner table, but uh, I love to recommend it because we eat food, we have to grow food, it goes somewhere, you know. I thought that if you were going to do the human manure, you as the individual then had to monitor what you were taking in. Yeah. Like you can't really eat large amounts of meat. You have to be careful about what pesticides and chemicals you might be consuming that then goes into the food, <coughs> that then goes into the soil, that then goes into the plant, that then goes back into you. Is that a big deal? Yeah. Well, it's something that, it's something that we have to be looking at right. and um, researching more. Right. Um, 
so and I do think that just like we talk about the paper it, it really cr it means that we and this is how I this is like whatever topic number eight or nine how composting can really contribute to positive social change because we have to start thinking cradle to grave so if we're using our own poo and we're eating crap that's funny <laughs> then, uh, um, you know, then what are we putting into our bodies? But the, the primary thing, I haven't heard it much about the meat issue, but um, is pharmaceuticals. Right, right. So these are also like chemicals that bioaccumulate in our environment and don't break down. So that's the biggest concern with using human art. Mm -hmm. So, but if we can, you know, um, but there's a lot of information out there about how to start moving away from pharmaceuticals and you know what we need is more research in these areas and research for public good instead of private profit um, and once that starts shifting then we'll start to get we'll be able to have more readily accessible information about this but these are all good questions and you know I know people I've know numerous places that have been and even in other countries where it's much more acceptable um, you know where human manure is, is really saving not only soils, but also watersheds. Because here we are flushing potable water down our toilets and what is simultaneously being in a water crisis in most areas of the world. So it's really, we have to start shifting our consciousness around these things and becoming, you know, um, less ooey and gooey about the systems of life. I was raised by a nurse, so maybe that's why I'm a little bit more open to talking about these things. So the outhouse is a good thing? The outhouse is a great thing, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, there, there's other ways to conserve water. There's a lot of, you know, cities and municipalities that are adopting mandates for uh, flush toilets that, you know, and you see now and all over the place, you have the one or the two option or, you know, you have toilets now that the water that is getting used to flush also pours over your hands so you can wash your hands with clean water and then that water goes in to flush the toilet. There's so many ways that we can really be, you know, inventive about how to recycle these nutrients and it, it is really adopting a consciousness of cradle to grave um, and then making sure that we have sustainability in all of those sort of places but I mean, if you had better soil to accomplish you would need the water less right? exactly yeah because there's more organic yep yeah. there's more organic matter in the soil so the plants are able to retain and um, utilize the water more efficiently so um, so I'm happy to answer more questions about the act of composting or how to turn it or what to inspect or what to look for or where to source it even. Um, um, yeah. What about keeping critters out of the compost? Keeping critters out? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, hardware cloth, um, chicken wire is really effective. Um, I've stapled it to pallets um, on the inside and the outside you know, all around, um, and then, you know, it depends on how technical you want to get with your with your bin system, um, because, but I've also, we the ones that we created at the school, we had, we made slats so that we could lift the boards out and to be able to access and then put the boards back in, and that seems to work pretty well. Um, you know, putting it in a place where, you know, maybe it's already in a fenced in area, like within your garden, and then it could be closer to where you're going to be putting it in the end. And if you have a fenced-in garden, maybe it would effectively be keeping some of the critters out. Um, you know, you can use certain products. Uh, some things, you know, we have a lot of clients that have a lot of uh, deer that eat any number of different perennials and hostas. And uh, it's a, we use all natural products called deer skid, and it's made of like coyote urine and all kinds of things. You could spray that around it um, just to help keep some of the critters away. Um, another really important thing is to make sure that you're really covering it completely so that you don't have a lot of raw material um, that is uh, exposed and drawing those critters. And um, also in the beginning I was mentioning that keeping dairy and meat scraps out of the pile is important. You know, dairy for one because it's mostly lipids and it, it creates an oily pro uh, product It's harder to break down. And meat because, you know, we get all kinds of wood chunks and skunks and stuff that are drawn. Eggshells, you can crunch them up and they help against slugs, right? Yes. Yeah, so eggshells provide actually a, a number of different nutrients to the compost pile. You know, almost arguably close to rock phosphate right. because of the because of the compounds. Um, but another way to get them into the soil is by crunching them up and putting them around the plants, um, the slugs. You know, and also cabbage loopers. Like there's a number of different pests that are in the garden that are um, all at some point in, or another are the form of a, a larva. 
and they don't like the eggshells because they're just really sharp um, edges. So, um, yeah, so it's nice to use that as, as a way to put around, you know, the base of brassica plants and other things. Yeah. Any other questions about this? Yeah. So I guess I know now already that I can't get by with just the one uh, bin that I have. So I need at least one more, maybe two more bins. Mm -hmm. But what do I do now that I've already messed up that first bin? Well, you know, you haven't messed it up. You've just taken the one. You've just taken the first step. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, what if you, you? And so you're putting your carbon and your nitrogen in that bin right now. Yeah. So what I would potentially do is, if you wanted to create more bins, you could do that, or you could just create, just start creating a carbon pile next to it somewhere. Okay. And an easy way to create a pile of leaves is to get a couple of stakes and some chicken wire. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the minimum that you need is three stakes. You could do four if you wanted to create a nice square bin. You know, stake them in, put the chicken wire all around, and then just start putting your carbon material into it. So you could do that right next to it. And then you could turn your pile out of the bin and then cover it with leaves and let it sit and then start creating another bin. And then, I mean, sorry, then use that bin for adding if it's easier to close off completely to like insects and critters, or not insects, but critters more so. Um, and then, so, or you could just build another bin. And um, there's a lot of sources for free pallets, you know, mm -hmm. uh, White River Paper right down the road, now called Swish or something, has pallets and they, you know, they're, they're happy to give them away. And you use that for the sides? Yeah, for the sides. So you can either screw, um, the simplest system I've seen has been used, we did it at the community garden a couple years back where they, you get these industrial size zip ties. <laughs> I'm not really carpentry inclined, so I'm, <laughs> and you can zip tie them and it's still standing and it's doing fine. So, um, but you know, you could also get some screws, you know, do, you know, secure in that way and then get buy some hardware cloth. It's, a, you know, it's fairly inexpensive and a staple gun and, you know, staple them to the inside and the outside. Um, depending on how, how much, you know, what your exposure to wild animals is, you might want to dig that in a little bit so they can't dig under. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you can create a gate or just have it be a four closed, you know, a closed system. If it's freestanding on the ground, sometimes with two people, you can actually lift it and move it, and then you can turn and work with your pile. And um, really, it's like any system, you know, there's many ways to do it, and, um, but it's, it's the way that's gonna work best for you is, the, is what encourages you to work with it. And, um, but, so that's why I try to give you like, the, just the basic ingredients, the volumes, the, the, the ratios, and then you can build on that. Great, thank you. What's hard work? Hardware cloth is um, it's a metal fabric, and it's you can get it with a and they're like little um, with holes. So anywhere between a half inch or quarter inch to three quarters inch. Um, so and you can get it at your hardware store, and they'll usually help you cut it, or you can just get 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 it by the yard. And you would put it inside the bin, yeah. So you just cut it to the lengths of your um, whether it's your like rough sawn hemlock or your pallet, and then you just line it. The only the tricky thing I've noticed with that is when you have a uh, garden fork and you're turning your pile, you just really don't want to hook it in the holes of the hardware cloth. All kinds of nuances to the process, but like I said, it's kind of fun and exploratory. So, so any other questions about the specifics of composting or what's needed or, or how to tell if you have a finished pile or what you could add or where to put it? Can you uh, elaborate more on that 30 to 1, what that means, and uh, practical scale? Sure, yeah. I think the number came out of, um, <laughs> came out of like, probably, you know, a uni an extension university, where they were basically trying to find the, the, the climate that is going to be most conducive to the bacteria that's needed for decomposition. So, you know, so it's kind of like, it's not necessarily like baking a cake, where you need, like, an exact teaspoon of baking soda. It's just, it's like an outline to help guide our process of collection and, and, and turning and, and management. So um, it's based on volume. So your carbon source would be, you want 30 to one, 30 parts to one. So what that looks like is um, translated into like a usable scale is, is basically just like layering. So when you have a compost pile, you layer your raw food scraps and then you want to cover it with double the amount of a carbon material. If I'm doing this at home, you talk about the three bins, if I have, you know, 
only so much space, and I have five pounds of food scraps. Is that going to need 50 pounds of carbon? No, it's not by weight, it's or, by volume. Or even by volume, okay. But still, five pounds can take up a fair amount of the bin. So, you know. So, kind of like, so translating that into like a visual, you know, you have a, you have a, about three foot by three foot, or th a four foot by four foot pile. You know, five pounds of, of food scraps would probably just create a, a like a thin layer of in that surface area. So then you would cover it about a third. So it sounds like a lot, but like when you're doing it, it's it's not like an overwhelming amount. It's just that you want to make sure that it's covered with like you know two inches at least. Yeah, like you want to do you know over thirty percent of what you're layering. So if you're layering an inch, you want you know like three inches. That's another good way to think about it. So. Yeah. I don't know if that helps. I mean, there's a lot of information out there if you want to, like, find out how do they get that ratio. Um, I think, you know, it's basically just on, it's based on time and environment, you know, and, and creating the ideal circumstances for that bacteria. Um, and we probably do need a little bit more of a definition around, like, how that came to be and how to really model that in a, in a realistic system. But because it's not like... You know, you don't need to create compost as big as this building, but it sounds like you would almost need to with that, that kind of a ratio. But really, it's just a matter of covering it, you know, um, two-thirds of more than what you have. Perhaps there are some things like watermelon rinds take up, or can take up a lot of space. And yeah. Some other things that do take up. Well, I've always, uh, I've learned, yeah, to chop up those watermelon rinds. I have a big cleaver and I'm just a piece of plywood. Yeah. Chop my cantaloupes, my all all that stuff. So, as you say, number one, there's more surface area. It, it's smaller chunks, so it breaks down. There's there's more air. It it just I think of it as cooking outside. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way to think of it. So um, this is corn seed. Mm -hmm. So would the corn husks be a good source of fiber? Yes, fiber? absolutely. And carbon. Mm -hmm. They yeah, would be. Well, they, so if you use them green, they're nitrogen. Green is nitrogen and brown is carbon. Yeah, could you repeat what Sure, yep. So um, the question was about corn stalks, since this is corn season, and um, and whether that's a good source. And it, it is a good source. If you're using it green, you're getting the benefits of the nitrogen. And if you're using it brown, you're getting the benefits of the carbon. So it's also great because they're hollow. So that's another thing that I've layered in garden. So you just be intentional about how you're layering it. Um, and one of the things that, you know, there's a couple of different ways to build a compost. One is progressional over time where you're bringing your food scraps and then you're bringing your carbon. Another is by creating your, your sources and then mixing them together. So that's what we would do, for instance, in the winter time. Some people put their food scraps into like plastic bags and freeze them. And then once it starts warming out, you bring them out and then you start mixing them with your carbon. Mm -hmm. um, so. Corn could be something that could be stored, corn stalks could be stored like in the way that leaves could be, where you would pull them or maybe cut them in half, because some corn, you know, is huge, it's eight feet tall, so if you cut it in half, you know, then you'll have the proper length, and then you could put your food scraps, your other carbon, your corn, and then follow that pattern, and you'll have a really ideal mix. Um, I would, you know, or the other thing is like this time of year, our compost piles are probably pretty big because we've been adding to them all summer. Um, what we could do is then turn it and put the corn into the next turning. So, yeah. Um, can you talk about the pros and cons of composting versus vermicomposting? Sure. So the, the question was, what are the pros and cons of composting versus vermicomposting? So uh, vermicomposting is utilizing earthworms. So one of the benefits of, of that is that the byproduct or the outcome of the, of the vermicomposting is the, is the high nutrient quality. And that's because of the micro, I mean, we're talking like back, like tiny, tiny bacteria in the organism, in the intestinal tract of the worm. It's almost like worms evolved specifically for this purpose. And I'm sure they have, but it's just so interesting because, so when they eat it, they're actually producing a more of a um, nutrient uh, dense. dense, thank you, product. And um, whereas composting has the worm, so it is getting that, that benefit and, and, so, it, so that's one difference. Um, when you do a worm bin, you're keeping an enclosed structure that you can add food scraps to that the worms are effectively composting now. So you can do that indoors. So like during the winter time, um, you can create a worm bin and put it under your sink 
and then put your food scraps in and then be effectively composting all winter long. Um, the benefits of composting are that you can do it outdoors, you can use more, like things will break down um, faster, like worms will take longer to break down certain things, like the watermelon rind, you know, like pits and stuff like that. I've turned my, in my compost, I've seen year after year after year. It's like, so, uh, so that's one, another difference. Um, and you can end up cooking I had a room and it's too hot and so you could have to eat slayers and they all fall. Oh. It's really good. Oh. <laughs> right, so yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it does it. You can like, get too Even in the shade, it's like, it yep. too hot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a, another quick question. When I was doing a vermicompost at my school, our teacher had us put the newspaper strips in water first. Yeah. Should we do that or not? Yeah, with vermicomposting, you do want to moisten the the scrap. Like, I, I've done the same thing. Like, you make the scraps and then you just spray it down with water. Uh -huh. and the moisture helps create an environment for the worms. So if you think about what their environment is in the natural world, it's dark, it's moist. Mm -hmm. So how do we recreate that for them? For normal composting Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would. I would spray the paper, of course. For both? Um, for, well, so the process of decomposition in a regular compost pile would have some natural moisture, especially if it's open to rain. Mm -hmm. um, I would only spray it if it's not decomposing and seems dry. Okay. But whereas in order to start the process for vermicomposting, you would need to start by spraying the paper. Okay. Coffee grounds? Oh, oh coffee yeah. grounds are great. Yeah, they're because they're because of the they're tiny particles. They have a lot of surface area, and they're great for worms. So they break down quickly. Okay. So that's another reason why that it's a really wonderful addition to compost piles. But they are food scraps. And they would be food scraps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They'd be carbon because of them. Yeah, they would probably mm -hmm. be more carbon than they would be nitrogen. Oh really? I would say. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? But they're yeah, moist, you know, because we're never, you, you see, the thing is, is there's so many factors to any one ingredient. So because they're moist, we're adding to them a compost pile, so they're going to actually act more like nitrogen, even though they're carbon. I mean, mm. does that make sense? Because you start to see, like, how the things, how the different ingredients really interact and, and change over time. So you want to make sure that you're... You know, at Coffee Grounds, actually, I should look into that. It might be a nitrogen store. I'm sorry. I, I would need it. I'm, I'm feeling a little stumped with that question, but because it's because it changes in the process of decomposition. So. Mm -hmm. Karen, would it be possible with the Coffee Grounds that they decompose to acidic for certain varieties of plants? Or is they, are they not strong enough within themselves to cause that kind of pH balance? Yeah, it's another good question. I don't know. I'm not sure. The question was if the coffee grounds would make more of an acidic environment, like they like it does in our bodies. And I don't know. Yeah, yeah maybe it depends on the ratio. Like if you're using a lot, maybe. Well, I was messing around with some coffee grinds and compost piles for berry bushes, right? So uh -huh. you make like a berry bush that like a high acidity. Oh yeah. On soil, and make a coffee grind drying rack for a total failure, but I know what I have to do next time. Right? <laughs> That's great that you did it though, and you learn now you know. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, let's go through 148. So the universal recycling law, it was basically to say, you know, we've already started recycling in a lot of areas, especially in Vermont, but we really need to be increasing the amount that we are recycling. So all the different numbers of plastics, I think we're up to eight, um, should now be able to be recycled. Um, it's going to be a law that's phased in, and I've outlined the basic timelines in the handout um, for the phasing in of the process. So, um, so we can see a bans oh, uh, disposal of metal, glass, plastics one and two, and paper and cardboard. So by this, well, last month now, right? Uh, we should see that all of the, those products are being um, recycled. And then leaf and yard debris by July, so by this time next year, we're going to be looking at the organic material that comes out of our garden and yards. And then by 2020, we're talking food scraps. Um, in my opinion, that's too late. We need to start doing it first. And already municipalities are starting to um, have discussions about what infrastructure is going to be required to compost um, the amount that we're talking about. Um, that's what they're trying to do is compost it, not convert it to... Correct. Yeah. 
So it is, yeah, they do want to compost it. Um, it does seem, you know, and it is the most efficient way to capture the nutrients and um, sequester carbon and all of that. Um, so it's going to take, uh, so currently as it stands, there's going to be mandated composting for municipalities if you're within 100 miles of a transfer station or um, facility that can take in that, um, that product. So if you're within, if you're outside of the realm of 100 miles, I haven't heard yet what the plan is, what they'll probably be doing is trucking it. But of course they're in this place, and when I say they, I'm talking about legislators uh, and municipalities are, you know, here we are, we wanted to, if, 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 you know, make the process more efficient. So it's not quite efficient if we're having to truck it over 100 miles. So we're either gonna see the, um, the uh, uh, emergence of new facilities that are specifically designed for composting, um, we're looking at current, you know, sites that are landfills that are capped. Maybe those are going to become sites that can take some of the, um, the food scraps and the organic materials. And um, so, the, so the mandate applies to certain areas depending on the distance from the, um, the processing facilities. Um, so, oh, and then, so here, the collection, there's two different... On the second, it says required parallel collection of silver. The collection of the facilities, they are going to start collecting in 2017. Um, but then by 2020, it's all, everyone's going to have to be doing it. So it's going to be phased, and they're trying to make it so that we're biting it off in um, digestible chunks. Compostable chunks. Compostable chunks. Um, so, so basically how this is going to impact our lives is um, any hauler, uh, whether it's a private or a public company is going to have to start collecting these things uh, without an additional cost. Um, so that's great for us. Um, it's not so great for the haulers. They're, you know, it, they're, they don't want to increase our tax dollars to provide the service. Um, so we're at a little bit of an impasse. Did you anything about grinding, like a big grinder, like say a municipality could have a big grinding machine at this like because, you know, you say there's oh, like thank you guys. Thanks for coming. An expense to the haulers, but if they could grind it up and turn it into a it. byproduct, then they could recoup their operating expenses. Have you heard anything about? It? I haven't yet. Um, I've been meaning to get to some of the. So currently, locally speaking, the big players are um, uh, Casella. We have a solid waste committee within Hartford. Um, we have a transfer station and the solid waste district or they're all really involved and i do think that that technology is going to become necessary in order to really start breaking this stuff down um and who purchases it who purchases it and where it goes is probably a big question i imagine places like casella are already starting to invest in that kind of thing um and because they're going to have to start really encouraging the, that the process sooner rather than later um so I think that um, in say, maybe like Connecticut, I think some of these bigger populated areas have already gone through this. Some have, yeah, and also like Portland, um, Chicago, Seattle, they're starting to collect. So I think what they're currently doing is they separate their food scraps and they're trucking it to places that can, where it can um, decompose in big windrows and big piles. Um, you know, industrial scale, scale composting facilities actually have these machines that are large enough to go over a pile and turn it. So it kind of looks similar to a car wash, but inversed, <laughs> if you can imagine. You know, so you, it, like, it just runs over the pile and And there's places like Vermont Compost, Carl Hammer, um, up in the Northeast Kingdom is already doing this. So it'll probably be something similar where you can, there'll be machines that come in and grind it as it sits, or we put it through it like a chipper and then it produces a more a finer material. Um, what's that? Yeah, right. Next to the microwave. <laughs> yeah, who knows how this is going to change our lives? Like, we're all going to become a lot more uh, knowledgeable about you know, what are the, the structures of life. Um, so, so, I just have one more question. Yeah. You said if you turn it, it expedites the process. So, you turn it once a week? I would say once the ideal is like six. once a month. So every four to six weeks. And that seems to be like what I found is like a sustainable management plan for my own lifestyle. 
Like, yeah. even though it's a kind of a simple task, like I'm not really gonna get to it more than once a month. Um, and that's basically what it, that's the, also the amount of time that it takes to reach the temperature of 130 to 140. Oh, thank you guys so much. So before you go, I, I have a, one favor to ask. If you could just, we're um, you know providing these workshops for free this year, but we do gladly accept donations. Um, next year, we're probably gonna charge a cost um, just because we find that there's um, more better rates of, of uh, you know, attendance and participation. Um, but we do um, love that you came and are really grateful. So if you could just write your uh, your name and your email and, and how you heard about us. Um, we try to get all of our notices and all the papers um, and all the listservs. Uh, word of mouth is one of the best ways to spread the news. So if you enjoyed the workshop today and you'd be willing to share it with a friend or, or some people, co colleagues or coworkers that you came to Henderson's and learned a lot, we would really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, we have a Facebook page. You can check that for regular updates. And we have a newsletter that goes out about once a month. Um, and that newsletter will also uh, keep you informed with when we have sales and specials going on here. But uh, one of the missions of Henderson's is to be educating about this. Um, so uh, we hope that you can take some of this information and continue to educate yourselves and, and other people as well. <laughs>